But truth be told, we're not feeling that unappreciated in this conference. There's uh, Jeff, who's done a two-day workshop on story mapping. There was an hour on user stories. I mean, that's not so bad. So what we'd like to do, um, it works out quite nicely, because none of the points we make have been really covered by the other sessions, and they complement each other quite well. Okay? And we thought we'd invite Ganesh, because he's a marvelous fellow. He's the remover of obstacles, the legendary scribe, the patron of arts and science, and of intellect and wisdom. Is that appropriate? That's very appropriate. So Ganesh is with us. And we're going to tell you a tragic comedy about how Agile really screwed up. But we're working towards a happy ending. And of course, stories are everywhere. And everyone loves a good story, not just kids. And stories are how we relate our culture. And last night, I will admit, I did not stick around for the evening plenary or the dinner. I was suffering from a case of what Americans call TMI, which is too much information. <laughs> so I left. And in the newspaper was an ad for a dance at a temple. And I said, OK. So off I went to a little neighborhood temple. Um, it was lovely. Um, so the, it was outdoors, and all the, all the families came with their little kids. And the kids all sat in, in front. And the dancers, I couldn't understand the, the narration, of course. But there was a lot of uh, pantomime. And I think, although I'm not sure, I think it was the story of Krishna, who, who does all these tricks, and he's very mischievous. And then, uh, so there was one male dancer and four women, and he kept playing jokes on them, and they played jokes on him. And at one point, he jumps off the stage, goes down and sits among the kids who are just loving this. So as the women dancers are looking for him, he's hiding among the audience. And you could watch this scene of the parents and the children. They were all enjoying the storytelling in different ways. And clearly, the culture is getting communicated. Okay? So Dave said he'd tell a story because he was a good fellow, and he stayed here and worked. <laughs> so I said, all right, what did I miss? And he said, oh, well, there were a lot of stories about cool code. So just tell him a cool code story. The cool code story is the cool code story. <laughs> so there is absolutely nothing more boring than reading computer source code, especially if it's not yours. <laughs> Nevertheless, we spent a rapt hour last night listening to exactly that. Uh, the, the interesting thing, of course, was is that we couldn't read the code, which was really cool <laughs> because the stories were what mattered. So we didn't listen to a presentation on cool code last night, or even a demonstration of cool code. We listened to stories about cool code, and that was enjoyable, and we learned a lot. OK. And one aspect of, of storytelling, so last night it was just one little bit about uh, Krishna and the, the girls. But when we put these different stories together, one informs the next one. So you get a contextualization of stories, which will then give you an entire culture. Okay? So an, a story out of context is not nearly as, a, as informative as a story in context. And this is exactly the same in our businesses. We tell stories, and in context, they will give us a theory, if you will, about what that culture is all about. So as a quick example, this is a little rubber ducky. And it's a vital part of the culture in Minneapolis. There's a, the Cray Company. So that little story is an example of how a company transmits to the next generation its culture. So one day, it's, it's a very nice building, and it's got a park. And as you go into the building, there's a small 
you know, water fountain pond thing. And one morning, there is a little yellow rubber duck floating in the pond. That day around noon, all the employees get a memo stating that little rubber ducks are unprofessional and we will no longer see little rubber ducks floating in the pond. We will be serious. The next morning, and the memo was sent by a rather new, rather uptight vice president who was there to manage. The next morning, that same pond had hundreds of little yellow ducks. And that vice president didn't last long. So this, this the yellow duck story is told as part of the culture and enculturation in Minneapolis. So yes, every year they have an annual Ducky Days, which is the company picnic, which celebrates this. Duck races, all kinds of fun things. And now they're in a big building with a real lake. All right. And suddenly the room got full. So let's give a minute to get people in here and settled. What? Well, a little extra drama never hurt. <laughs> well, what, you, what you've missed really is a very general statement that uh, stories are everywhere and it's our main mode of transmitting cultures from one generation to another. And I just told a little story about a yellow duck. Um, the second main point that we really want to explore with you is the idea that p stories are incredibly powerful. They're not silly. They're not a waste of time. They're incredibly powerful. And I'd like to, this is a quote from um, Roger Shank who's written a great deal about storytelling. And he he, uh, this is his definition of intelligence. So to be intelligent is to have something worthwhile to say and to know how and when to say it to those who need to hear it. Interesting definition of intelligence. And the easiest way to say something to someone else, and how and when, is through stories. So as we've gone through this seminar, how many of you have been here for, four, for all, both tracks, management? Oh, quite a few. Okay. So over the days, I've been watching um, speakers and the audience. And it's been interesting to see which ones were using the stories, which ones were not. So Linda's here. I was quite impressed. I heard t not all of Linda's, but two of Linda's. On the one on um, stereotyping and prejudice, and then one on how we can't estimate anything, and how effective they were because, one, she told stories, but two, she told stories in a way which allowed the audience to tell stories to themselves about themselves and laugh at themselves. A marvelous form of education. So in terms of intelligence, let me break this down a bit with you. One of the main things is with um, stories, stories are evocative. So they're not a set of facts. They bring all kinds of things to mind. They maintain ambiguity. You can interpret them differently. So they allow us to remind ourselves of things and to generalize. So in Linda's example, the stories of the 12-year-olds the, the at camp and the two groups of 12-year-olds who got real connected and it's us and them 
and then how the camp leaders change that. So we can take that story and remind ourselves of our own childhood, generalize it. So let me tell you a story, and then we'll see what it reminds you of. This is a Japanese story about two Zen monks. And the two Zen monks were very pure, celibate, poor. And they were walking along the river one day. And as they walked along the river, and it, it had rained heavily, so the, the water had risen, they're walking along the river, and they come across a beautiful geisha. The geisha wants to cross the river, but the, the water is too high. She cannot get across. So one of the Zen monks picks her up in his arms, carries her across the river, sets her down, returns, and continues on his walk with his companion. A mile or two down the stream, the companion says, how could you have done that? And the first one said, my, 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 I put her down several miles ago. <laughs> You're still cowering her. So there's a very ambiguous story. What does it remind you of? How could you use that story? Any volunteers? To let, to let go of things? To recognize that you have not let go of things? Fine. Anyone else? Yeah. The, the spiritual of an idea is more than the physical form of it. The spiritual side of something is more important than the physical aspect of it. Lovely and very different. Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> That's unbeatable. The more you hold it, the more it hurts. <laughs> so if as managers and as in working groups, a well-selected story has a lot of mileage in it. A story is also the best thing we have to increase our memory. So compare. The queen dies, the king dies. With? The king died, and then the queen died of a broken heart. Which one are you going to remember? The second one, because you've put them together. They're connected. So stories are, we call them like fish bones. And if you can remember one bit of it, it will pull and to the surface other bits of it. So a story form is always more memorable than a set of facts or a non-story form. Okay? They also allow us to think less. Okay? So what is this picture of? The, the, the emperor's, the story, the emperor's new clothes, okay? How many of you know the story? Oh, okay. So you're having a conversation, and you don't even have to have a long conversation. You just say, oh, that king is naked. And worlds are communicated, okay? So... During the break, I, I was talking to Linda, and we're chatting away, and Linda says, well, no tilting at windmills. That's all she needed to say, and a world of information was communicated. So what story was she referring to? Don Quixote, who was a bit crazy, and kept attacking windmills. So we can use these story captions to convey worlds of information very succinctly. Okay. And we can use common skeletons. So, 
there was one, t I think it was actually Linda's, uh, so the, um, the, the Indians do much better. The American divorce rate is 50-50. You get married, you have 50% chance you'll stay married, 50% chance you'll divorce. Okay. So there are a lot of divorces, right? And we have to tell stories about our divorce, your divorce, his divorce, your divorce. And so we just have skeletons which allow us to not go into the detail of each one. We just find a skeleton to hang it on. Oh, well, his failing manhood and he needed a younger woman. That's all you need to say. Or this one, well, what do you expect? All men are jackasses. So we use these skeletons to very efficiently convey great deals of information. Um, and we also use them through to we tell stories which are small analogies. This is actually a true story which I will tell you. That is my mother. Um, and my mother, at the age of 90, said, I want a computer. She actually didn't want a computer. She was very annoyed that all the children, and there are five of us, we were all communicating by email, which left her out. And someone had to think to go and inform her. And my mother, being a bit of a drama queen, wants to be the center of attention. So what she really wanted was not a computer, but to be in on the family st stories stuff. So we get her a computer. And after a while, it's one of our favorite family stories. She doesn't understand the computer, and she says, so who do I write to to tell them that I really am not in the market for a 10-inch penis? She could not comprehend a system where there was not a boss to whom you could write and say, I don't want this or that. But a decentralized network was beyond anything she could actually comprehend. Okay. So with using stories like this, you can make analogies between one person and another, and again, communicate quite effectively. And we also use stories, especially with, with management, when you're really trying to convey wisdom. You can do so much with stories. Okay. Um, pr my favorite American wise man might be Mark Twain, who could give you in one line stories a world so, for example, he said, ah, yes, I remember when I was 16, my father knew nothing. By the time I got to 18, he'd really learned a lot. Okay. So, again, we use these stories to quickly and easily convey things. Okay? And those of you who are in the business side, you also know that there are a number of management techniques which are story-based. And one of the most effective planning tools are the business scenarios. And some of you may know that that was first started in the early 70s. Actually, the key date was 73 when there was the oil crisis. And at that time, Shell was playing around with the storytelling techniques of telling, of asking the top management, come up with what if stories. What if this happened? What would we do? And how would we know that that was happening? So in this technique, which the shell then went through, one of the stories that they made up was, well, what if the oil countries got together and started to set prices. 
what would we do? And what would be the early signs that would tell us this was in the works? And in 1973, Shell actually said, that's not likely. But the management technique was to use the discipline of telling the story and then working it through. What would be early signs? What would we do? And the fact that they had actually gone through this method, this technology, when in fact it did happen, it put them way ahead of the other oil companies. So in Shell, they put that storytelling technique down as one of the foundations of their, their current strengths. But what about you guys? What happened in Agile? Well, we found, on the whole, that Agile screwed up. They had the opportunity for stories and didn't take it where it needed to go. I'll turn it now over to Dave, because he's the Agile guy and I'm not. But we know that Agile needs stories. You can have, you want this? Here, that fellow might know. Okay, you need stories as an agile developer, or you need stories as any kind of a developer, because it's the only way you're going to find out what it is that you have to do. If you ask a user for a set of requirements, or tell me specifically and exactly what you want, you're going to get a work of fiction, but it's not a story. It has no content. It's just a bunch of words in a list. If you go to the customer and tell me, what are you doing today? What's your problems? What are you encountering? They're going to give you a story. They're going to tell you a story about their life. Uh, and then you're going to be able to elaborate on that story or interact with them, talk through that story, and find out the details and the specific things that you can then act on. You'll also find out which things are really important to act on because you can tell from the story what really matters or what is really of interest to the person. Uh, there's a variety of other things that they come in. So we had this, uh, this notion of stories right from the beginning of Agile. We're going to tell user stories instead of doing requirements. Cool. What does the user story look like? Well, it's a narrative on a 3 by 5 card. Okay, cool. What does a story look like? What is in a story? What is uh, not in a story? That was not cool. We had no idea what to do with those things because nobody ever taught us anything about telling stories. Nobody ever taught our customers anything about telling stories. We have been training our customers for 50 years. Don't tell me anything except the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Nothing more, nothing less. That's all I want from you. Um, you know, don't embellish it with anything else. The fact that a story is supposed to create or redress a power imbalance. It is supposed to bring us closer together to our customers uh, instead of separating us on this, with this big contract in the middle. So we need the stories. And we were told to do stories. And we were told to do this. Tell me a story. Well, a story has a lot of metaphor in it. Can't have a metaphor and a requirement. It's just a fact. Something that uh, the computer can understand. It should have mystery. It should have ambiguity. Because a story is an invitation to explore a problem set that neither party understands. So we start telling stories. We start using metaphors. We start thinking about what it is that we want to do. This is where we started in Agile. And then we went to this. Because we were uncomfortable or didn't know how to deal with stories, per se, we reduced them continuously in various different ways uh, through various definitions until we get down to a template that basically yields a story or excuse me, yields a requirement, uh, nothing, nothing more, nothing less. 
And then we find ourselves, surprise, surprise, in the exact same situation as the waterfall people. We've got a bunch of things that are called user stories, which are really requirements. They don't really fit either category, and they're useless. If I'm going to tell a story, I don't say as a student, I want the system to do X so that I can Y. I put it into a story narrative form with an author, uh, with the client, a perspective, a vocabulary. The vocabulary is supposed to come from the domain. So the other thing we've trained our users to give us in their requirements is vocabulary which reflects our world and not theirs. <coughs> so a good story would be something like uh, the students that are in this online class, they want to know who else is there, who else can they communicate and talk with uh, and be able to select from them and initiate a conversation with them. Doesn't sound at all like a templated story, but it's, it's rich with interesting things. You can deconstruct the story so you can find the characters. These are potential objects uh, that you may have to build at some point or another. Uh, props, which are also kinds of objects, but they are playing a passive role. They are service providers rather than actors in this particular kind of a story. Uh, these are other actors, and this happens to be an action. You know, I want to chat. Well, what do you mean by a chat, you say? Find out. Sit down with a student and find out what they mean. Ask them to elaborate and contextualize and elaborate and uh, uh, expand the story. It is sometimes useful. This looks a little bit more comfortable to uh, computer types. It's perfectly fine to visualize a story. Uh, th this happens to be a very sparse kind of visualization. A much better thing would be to draw me a picture of your environment and show me a bunch of happy kids on online classes talking to each other. Uh, but my artistic capabilities are rather sparse. And so I resort to these kinds of things. Uh, but again, it's just a way of visualizing a story. We have an airport traffic controller that is responsible for making sure no, air, no two airplanes collide. Okay, the airport traffic controller has an airspace and he says, hey airspace, what kinds of airplanes are existing in your area at the moment? You know, how many airplanes do you contain? Who are they? Let me talk to them one at a time, please. Uh, hey, airplane number one, where are you? You know, I haven't thought about that lately. I've been traveling and I've been moving from place to place. I have no clue where I am at the moment, but I know who does. Hey, instrument cluster, can you compile or can you put together a location for me? And the instrument cluster says, sure, I can do that. Um, I don't really know how to do that, but I know how to ask the right people so I say, hey, instrument, al altimeter, how high are we? And then I ask uh, the uh, airspeed controller, uh, you know, how fast are we going? And I ask the compass, you know, what is our direction? What is our vector? And I get answers back. And these are just little numbers. And I say, direction, or excuse me, location, object, please hold these numbers and send them back to the airplane so that it can report them to the air traffic controller. The airplane says, sure, gets the stuff back, says, hey, location, please add my name to your list of values, and I will send it back to the uh, air traffic controller. So by telling a story of that sort, I am identifying exactly how I should decompose my system, how I should distribute responsibilities across the system, how I should distribute knowledge or data across that system. And remarkably enough, it becomes incredibly simple. There is no object in that story that is doing anything really difficult, really hard, requires more than four or five lines of code uh, to actually requires more than one or two lines of code uh, to accomplish its task. So I get an immense amount of power from telling a story and making sure that the story makes narrative sense and then mapping my design onto that story. 
And this is just a way of visualizing it up on a whiteboard. It has no value anywhere else. Uh, but this too then becomes a story for you. So now you have this really big complex story, day in the life of the, tr of the uh, airport. And you have a whole bunch of these little individual stories. And that's your product backlog because you've been asked to automate the airport, build an air traffic control system. So now you have all these little stories and you've got a big product backlog up here. Uh, and this team over here is working on one story and this team over here is working on the other story. But this thing is still up on the whiteboard. So it's an evocative trigger that remembers or recalls to mind, even if you don't remember the details. You look at that, you say, aha, and you go back and it brings back into your mind the story and then you can proceed uh, with your work. So it's giving you instant context uh, and the user story on its 3x5 card does the same thing. So how is that visualization different from CPT? It's not. In terms of syntax, yes. But, uh, and I can even, you know, I can even play with the syntax to make the story more expressive. So I could put a little uh, circle here at the end of this arrow, uh, which means a loop. So the story is uh, the, the one, um, the control tower sends a message to the airspace and the airspace uh, to ask how, you know, the airplanes that are in it. And it gets back a collection of airplanes. So now I'm going to ask that collection of airplanes for the next, to iterate across itself and give me each airplane one at a time. That story starts to sound kind of long and involved. You know, airplane number one, airplane number two. Plus the fact I don't know how the story ends because I don't know how many airplanes are in there. So I just put a little circle up here and says, the air sp or the, this collection is going to iterate and give me all the stories that I need. Uh, so I can embellish the syntax uh, to do things, but only if it allows you to be more expressive in your storytelling. Not so that it fits a UML template. Okay, take the word requirement out of that sentence and say it again. <laughs> really? Take the word requirement out of there and say your, you know, ask your question again or make your comment. Yes. So uh, until I responded to his question, I talked about the airspace. I didn't talk about a collection. Okay, say it again louder. I don't think in the back page. Okay, so, so he was saying that I'm using things like objects and collections and so on. But I think this is not interaction between the story Yes. So actually, I, again, if I want to... If I want to really tell a big story, I can tell the story um, and then I can say, there, I put a little square box here instead of um, a circle. And, the, the, and then I put a label on it and it basically says, see story X. So I can nest and embed stories and I can tell really elaborate things. Um, if you ever have the opportunity, there's a novel called The Historian by um, Kostova is her last name, and I think it's Elena, but I'm not positive. Um, it, it is a story, it's a big thick book. It's a story of a young girl off to find her mother. Her mother disappears one day and she's gonna go find her. Uh, her mother is off hunting a vampire. She don't know that for a while. Uh, so she sets off on her quest. At every point in her quest, she encounters somebody that helps her go forward, and that person helps her by telling a story. Sometimes it's her father, sometimes it's some other character. So she goes to a library in Istanbul, and she hears the story of Vlad the Impaler and how he invaded Istanbul, and all of this to find a book, which she eventually finds, but... Uh, so it's, it's these nested stories is the way that we tell big stories. 
and you can put it in the syntax if you want to, again, if it helps you tell a better story. And yes, you don't use your vocabulary, you use his vocabulary, you know, the, the domain expert's vocabulary. And if you do these kinds of things, you will have a happy ending. Everybody will have a happy ending. Your customer will get, in fact, exactly what it is that they want. You will get things that make your job a lot easier. You'll write a lot less code, which means you're going to write a lot less buggy code, which means that 10 years from now, there's not going to be standing, someone standing up in this room, I guess it was, and pointing out all of this idiotic legacy code that nobody, that everybody wrote without paying attention to what you were told to do. So, so there will be a happy ending. Oops. I missed a story in here somewhere. No, uh, just keep going. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is, uh, okay. Yeah, so let me, um, where'd our beer go? We had beer here a minute ago. We had a slide with beer on it. it it's good. Keep, going. keep going. Okay. Aha, right, well, uh -huh, there it is. Go. There it is. Wait, but go oh. back. This is an important. This, all right. Well, well, what I think doesn't happen with software people is you're told to write stories, but no one tells you how. Ah. So this next slide is what people who do English literature learn but software people never learn. Okay? So what's a good story? A good story has these characteristics. There's always a point of view. Who's telling the story and why? So I told you the story about my mother. My mother would tell it differently, wouldn't she? Of course she would. <laughs> There's a theme. Is the theme clear? There's invariably a hero, a protagonist, a main character. And you don't have to like the hero or the main character, but you have to be able to somehow empathize with them. So I was talking to this gentleman here who's from Sweden, and of course everyone has read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. So you don't have to like the young woman, who's the main character, but you kind of have to understand where she's from, she's had a hard life, so of course she's kind of difficult. So there's got to be some ability to empathize with the main character. The main character interacts with a cast of characters. Okay. So you have interactions which form a plot, and then there are definite outcomes. So these are, if you take a, a degree in English literature, you're reading and you're analyzing stories for these characteristics. And if you're an aspiring novelist, you're writing stories paying attention to these characteristics. And in fact, in software, that's precisely what you should be doing, but you go blind because no one ever teaches you about heroes and plot and outcome. So let's just think over the last, what, three, four days, if you, to whatever you've been here. What has been the most memorable story that you'd be willing to share with us? And let's just look at it to see if it has these characters. You've heard lots of stories over the last few days, all kinds of stories. Pick one where you said, ah, that's an interesting story. I can learn from that. You want to go? Go. Okay. <coughs> well, this actually leads that story uh, about the uh, group of kids talking about this fast and fair and prejudice. That's that kind of story. Okay, let's go for that. So, how many heard that story? A few, but not enough. Um, all right, so well, Linda's here. She can probably do it better than I can, but I can start. Um, this was a research, really old, like 68, 58, 
50, okay? They took 12-year-olds who were quite similar. They were kind of lower middle class. They were all white. They were all Protestant. They were just a bunch of pretty similar kids. They divide them into two groups, and we find that the two groups then quickly become groovy. So you guys, who look like you guys, say, okay, this is our this is our code name, and we're a tribe, and we don't like them because they live over there. So they're the enemy. And and what Linda was saying is we're hardwired to do that. And we're hardwired, which is a good thing, to kind of get along in a group. So the story unfolds uh, about how about that transformation. Each group becomes a tribe. We fight. And then the camp leaders have to create overarching problems to solve, which will then big bring the two groups together. Okay? So have a go at it. So what was the so let's just go down. What's our, our qualities there? What was the point of view? Point of view was an observer of the experiment. Okay, so it's this witnessing the scene point of view, a third person point of view. Okay? What was the theme? Get them together. I think because, uh, I mean, there is one thing that is the obvious theme, and that is kids in a camp into two different camps. So it's kind of a setting. But then there's uh, obviously the theme of the experiment of the, uh, you know, this grouping and testing if, if, if we, because as you say, they, they actually prime the kids. Yes. to become more hostile towards the others by, you know, not really telling them about each other and stuff like that. So there's a theme about getting these hostility and then trying to solve it. Yeah. That's that kind of yeah. theme as well. So we've got an outside observer, and we've got a theme of this is a social experiment. They're really studying the behavior of these kids, and they're running scientific experiments and messing around with behaviors to see the results that they're going to get. So the point of view and the theme are really about scientific method. What can we learn about social behavior? And then after telling you the story, Linda's saying, well, what does that tell you? You're not 12 years old. You're not from Oklahoma. But you're just like us. So it's uh, the scientific hypothesis, which is a theme, is based upon other things like Lord of the Flies or Animal Farm. How do we come to be separate and unequal in different kinds of things? And this is a long literary tradition of this kind of a story. And the hypothesis would not have any power as a scientific experiment if you did not have this other kind of theme and context to try and explain. Right. with the experiment. But we've got the kids, we've got a cast, we've got interactions. First they get together, then they fight, then they have to find the flood because it, it, the, the water's been cut off, so they have to solve the problem together, so we get outcomes. So that story was memorable because it was a good story. Yes. If the and only it, thing it lacked. had a purpose, which was push you to think about how much we are just like those 12 year olds in our office setting and how much we can learn from that story. But it was memorable because it was a good story. So this is what we really would like to encourage you to work on in the, in the coming weeks and days is to get beyond this kind of requirement, you know, and to think, all right, have I got a point of view? Have we got a plot here? Have we got an outcome? Why am I telling this? Is it to convey wisdom? Is it to be evocative? Is it to be memorable? But it's getting clear on why you do the story 
and how you will construct a good book. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. There's no hero in this story, but there is a villain. The villain is the scientific researchers who are doing evil things that they would no longer be allowed to do. But it's remin reminiscent of another kind of a story, the, you know, the cruel, indifferent, objective scientist story. Uh, Jenny and I are both anthropologists. One of the earliest anthropological studies was in France. And they took little kids and put them in cages next to wild animals. I mean, they took infants and put them in cages next to wild animals. And they were fed and reacted with exactly like all the other animals in the zoo. And the idea was, is civilization innate or not innate? Is the scientific answer sufficient to justify that kind of cruelty to a human being? Probably not. Oh, I think it was, if I remember correctly, it was actually an experiment. The hypothesis was that if you don't teach a child to eat the English or um, yeah. French or it's Canada. What do you, what do you speak? Yeah, Canada. Canada. Okay. If you don't teach a child any of those languages, would the child naturally just open his or her mouth and speak Sanskrit? <laughs> we have a story about that. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, we've got the story of Mobley. So actually, although it wasn't very nice to these kids, there was a hypothesis and a, an attempt to set it up to actually find out. And the main thing I got from Linda's book, the, the two talks from Linda that I heard, was that in the software world, we actually don't push that culture of, that sets something up systematically so we find out. We just say, oh, let's experiment in the sense of, well, mess around. But, you know, messing around is not, let's do this and compare it with that and see what kind of outcome we can, we can actually seriously look at. Okay? So, um, so now I get to talk about beer. <laughs> A story has a narrative, has an author, it has a point of view. So how you tell a story is important, and this is really important for people who are designing software. So I have collected you all together and I, I am running this brewery slash bottling plant. So I am brewing a whole bunch of really, really excellent beer over here. I wanted to get it into bottles and eventually I want to distribute it so that it's consumable. Uh, your, your choice is to build that, implement that. So the very first thing you have to do as a storyteller is saying, okay, what is the story of this, this uh, brewery as a whole? So uh, up here on the mezzanine above the vats where you can't see it is a big control panel that monitors the brewery floor. Uh, you have vats of beer. Uh, inside of those are beer. You have all of these bottles and bottling devices, capping, fillers, labelers, washers, all these kinds of things. You have a mug of beer, and over here you can imagine a consumer. So pick from those different kinds of things and tell the story of what's going on in that brewery, and you'll get very different understanding of what it is that you have to build. So you can think about that, you know, who is the narrator, of, uh, who is the appropriate narrator for this story? From whose point of view should it be told? On whose behalf does that brewery exist? I mean, the whole system exists for, to serve somebody. Answers? Guesses? So the customer, the person who needs a tall, cool one? The uh, investor, the, <laughs> hmm? the control panel. Okay. So. Yeah. 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 Okay. So okay. Tell me that story. Well, you know, I start out life as most of the water, and then I 
and then I cannot get mixed up. And oh, here I am, and now I really want to go to the uh, consumer because that's the point of my life. I want to be consumer. Yes. So I need to leave this uh, first place and go into some kind of container so I can get to the consumer. Yes. Uh, a bottle. Yeah. Uh, let's go to a bottle. I need a pipe or something. Go to a bottle. And uh, into the bottle I go, and I want to look really nice, so uh, the consumer will want to buy me and put in a glass and consume it. That's hmm? kind of yeah. the way I would that's the, the, a good way to do it. You're computer geeks. You're supposed to sit and say, oh, from the control panel. I mean, that's the software that you have to write, right? So this control panel is control of keeping track of all these dumb machines down there on the factory floor and figuring out all possible scenarios for getting things back and forth. And you'll write a command and control program that'll be this long right? if you don't get the story right. So there, there's, yeah. Plus just the, the control logic for all of the possible permutations of everything that could go wrong in that brewery is a big program. So. How are they going to use it though? What is their story? Their story is, I am responsible for this big thing and I need to be kept informed of if there's a problem or if everything is going smoothly. So all I need to ask from the control panel is, everything okay? Or if something goes wrong, let me know. Two very simple stories and that's, that's the extent. So the relationship between the control panel and the user is just those two things. There's nothing more. Yes. And yeah, you can do that and you're going to end up again. You know, trailing data, long data stream coming back, and the behavior is not going to be where it needs to be in order to be simple. So yes, you you can do a, a typical top-down decomposition and and call it a set of stories. However, it won't work. Last thing, self-serving. Jenny and I are have published a paper. It's on the uh, website along with the slides for this deck called Patterns of Storycraft. It's the start of a book on the same subject, and it has a number of things that tell you how to be a better story writer. You so. probably mention one or two. Oh. Yeah. Are there basically uh, any techniques to identify the years that it's not a view in the system to be able to tell the story about? That's a very good question. So how to decide who is the narrator or the author of the story, the point of view of, of the story? Uh, it's a heuristic called primary client. So particularly in an object world, it's all client server. I mean, it's, it's uh, instead of a client server or a three-tier client server, it's an N-tier client server. So every object should be providing services to somebody else. And you can... You can kind of just you know tell stories about you know what 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 do I do as a as a bottler or as a capper? I well I put caps on bottles. Well, how do I know when and how to do that? 
on you know when the bottle is there asking for a cap and then you just kind of follow that chain from many different points of view until you start to see there's a trend that this is the person who is the ultimate primary client and that's where it gets tricky because you really only have two choices as you follow these trails it's going to come down to the control panel or the beer and you're going to be really really tempted to use the control panel because it looks I mean it is in a sense it is monitor it is tracking everything but it's just an observer the service that it provides is the fact that it knows where everything is and what its state is at any given point in time so it can be a global resource that anybody else can ask for help so if you think of what are the services it provides it points away from itself so you The, uh, the data shows up much later after you've told your story and you're starting to think about implementing it. So you say, okay, yeah, right. So now I know that I am a capper and I have to um, put a cap on a bottle. What do I need to know to do that? I need to know that there's a bottle there asking for a cap. It's the only thing I need to know. So you're, you, do not, you no longer have data you have knowledge. The, the knowledge that the thing requires to do what it is expected to do. Um, or another answer, because that was a, a very important question. Now, how do you know how to write it? Is to go back to that Robert Shank, uh, Roger Shank's definition of intelligence. You have to have something to say, and then you decide who needs to hear this, and how do I need to write the story so that they will hear it. And that will tell you, well, this is the point of view, this is the hero, this is the outcome. Because many stories, you can tell them differently just by changing the point of view. So it's that basic definition of intelligence. What do you want to say to whom? And then you say, OK, here's the best way to offer up this story. So your choice of the the memorable story about the kids, and then Linda made decisions, this is what I want to say, this is my audience, how am I going to present that story? And there are different ways to present it. But she made choices according to that first question. Why am I telling this? To whom? And then how am I best going to approach it? This is what you do with use case assessment. So you have some primary access. The use case is mostly written from that or whatever objection that this primary actor wants to achieve. And there could be one or more actors who are also interacting with this. That's what happens in a use case. That's what's supposed to happen in a use case, yes. Do you have some examples from business context on this story relation? Uh, there will be many in the book, and we're actually technically out of time, so. Well, but I mean, but so we did post this article, which gives you patterns for writing stories. Um, well, this one you probably recognize is in this net. So one story informs other stories, which informs the story here. So this, this is what you do in story mapping is you are, you're constructing a net, so each one makes the other stronger. Um, this one, which is the Just So Stories from Kipling, is it's very useful to write a story about why something is there, how it began, so that as you go back on old code, you can see what it was. Okay. Uh, the other one is Tell Me Three Times. Okay. So, so last so comment. That's a place to yeah. start. Last comment dealing with this, this notion of a use case. So we have used scenarios. We've talked about scenarios in this business since the 70s, which telling a story about what's, what's wanted and what's needed. We talk about user stories uh, in, in Agile. Again, talking about stories. Ivor Jacobson came along and said, I want something that is more formal, that strips the mystery, strips the characterization. I want just the bare bones facts. And, and he actually refused. He says a use case is not a scenario. 
for precisely those kinds of reasons, that scenarios and stories have all kinds of stuff that was irrelevant for a use case as, uh, as it was conceived. So that's why a use case can be a vehicle, just like the interaction diagram for d picturing a story or describing a story, but I will bet you, you will not use it as such because you will follow the instructions for a use case, which is not a scenario, according to the author. I didn't hear her, I'm sorry. Um, sooner or later, yes, you're going to. Yeah. So the, the question is that um, there will be a point in time. So if you're trying to understand what it is that you want to build, if you want to do design about who's going to do what and how your modularization is going to work and all this sort of thing, you need stories. Then you have to sit and say, okay, now how am I going to implement this story on the computer? And at that point, you may engage in a translation. What you should find out, that is if you have told the stories well, the, the translation is going to be very simple, very direct, very straightforward. And, and so if you, if you have a really complicated use case, it means you didn't tell your stories well enough and didn't do your design well enough. So, okay, we're over time, so. Where's the link for the, it's on the, on the website. It's on the website with all the PowerPoint slides from all the presentations. Oh, okay. The conference website. Yeah, the conference, the conference website. website.